Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome again to CAFTA. Uh, my name is Phil Yaffe, and I'm the one who runs CAFTA. I want to thank you for attending this month's or this bi monthly webinar that we've been having since uh, everybody went into quarantining. So, this month, or I'm sorry, this week, we have Heather McHugh, who's the lead developer, lead FileMaker developer at Harmonic Software Production Studios. And this week, she's doing a presentation on FileMaker and HIPAA. Our next meeting will be July 10th, which is three weeks from now. And that's because July 3rd is a holiday and we won't be meeting that week. So we're meeting on the second Friday of July, which is the 10th. And I don't have an exact uh, description of that webinar, but it will be something presented by Salian about using AWS, um, Amazon Web Services. And after that, we'll have a meeting on July 17th, two week, or I'm sorry, the next one will be July 24th, two weeks after July 10th. This week, we're trying a new webinar platform called Demio. Um, and it's a little different than using our usual Ring Central Zoom meetings. Um, attendees can't share their audio video. There's just audio video for the presenters, which are Heather and I. If you have any questions, go ahead and enter them in the chat that's on the right, and then we'll flag those as questions, and that's how you can get them to Heather. Um, we did it. We're doing this because the number of RSVPs had grown way beyond what a video webinar could handle, video meeting. Um, we were up to 74 in the last one, and that's kind of way too much to handle in a Zoom meeting. So we're trying to see how this goes. We're kind of doing it on a trial basis. Um, I think this is what we're gonna do going forward. But if you have any feedback, go ahead and let me know. Just, you can enter comments on the Meetup site or email me from the Meetup site um, if you have any feelings about how this is going with the new webinar. Um, videos of all the earlier CAPTAs are up on Salient TV. Um, you can find the links for each event on the Meetup page itself or you can go to YouTube and look up the Salient TV channel. Um, for last month's meeting where we did FileMaker 19, there's a video of the meeting and there's also links on Meetup to both Mark and Steve's demo files. For this week, Heather will be presenting for about an hour. After the first hour, we'll keep the meeting open for another half hour for more questions about FileMaker or HIPAA or anything else you wanna talk about that's FileMaker related. And now after all that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Heather and she can go ahead and start her presentation. All right, thank you, Phil, for inviting me. I always love the CAFTA group. Um, some of you have been around a while, may know I was there, I don't know, 17 years ago, kind of, I think it was circa FileMaker 8. So uh, good, great crowd, glad to be here, even virtually. So I'm gonna do a little technical thing here, move some screens around switch what I'm sharing, and then we'll get going here. All right. As advertised, looks good. All right, welcome. Our topic today is HIPAA compliance, and I'm Heather McHugh, lead developer at Dallas-based Claris Partner, Harmonic Software Production Studios. I'm not going to bore you by reading aloud the minutia of details that's shown here on this slide. Uh, the gist of which is that I've been around a good long while and much of my FileMaker career has been spent working with compliance for regulated environments. Before we get started, I should clarify that I'm not an attorney. However, what I share with you today is based on three decades of FileMaker experience, nearly two of which have revolved heavily around compliance. Okay then, let's dive in. If you develop FileMaker-based custom apps intended for use within the medical industry, you need to be familiar with HIPAA. If you were familiar with HIPAA back in the day, it's time for a refresher. And even if you don't expect to take on any HIPAA-regulated clients, you may just find the topic more relevant than you expected in light of recent pandemic-related changes to workplace environments and workforce distributions. Our outline for today includes the basics, your responsibilities, the specifics, development, and deployment. The basics. So, enacted by Congress in 1996, HIPAA, which stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, so two A's, not two P's, went into effect nearly two decades ago. HIPAA is administered by the Department of Health and Human Services. The Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, also known as HITECH, was introduced 
Oh, it's also administered by HHS. And the High Tech Act was created in 2009 to motivate the implementation of electronic health records or EHRs and their supporting technology. Then in 2013, HHS introduced the HIPAA Omnibus Final Rule, a single rule to finalize their implementation of both HIPAA and the High Tech Act. HIPAA itself is technically 45 CFR parts 160, 162, and 164, titles one through five. Our focus is on title two, administrative simplification, which covers four areas represented here as TIPS. Those are the transaction codes, identifiers, the privacy rule, and the security rule. Now, when a covered entity refers to HIPAA compliance, they could be referring to any of the four provisions within Title II. But when speaking of HIPAA compliance in the context of systems or development, we're specifically referring to the security rule. The security rule itself boils down to two primary objectives ensuring confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Sounds simple and obvious. Well, the meaning of confidentiality is fairly obvious anyway, but what about integrity? And why is availability a concern? We'll get into these when we discuss the HIPAA specifics. Keep in mind that the need to protect against unauthorized access applies to both internal and external threats from known and potentially unknown sources. So what data specifically is covered by HIPAA? Electronically stored PHI within the medical industry, which by the way is not limited to a doctor's office or hospital. And what exactly is this PHI that we need to protect? It essentially boils down to this. If the data can be used to uniquely identify a specific individual, then it's PHI and it's subject to the provisions of HIPAA and high tech. So who needs to comply with HIPAA? The covered entity, your client, may be a provider, medical practice or facility, a research lab, or even a medical equipment manufacturer. If your client is in the healthcare industry and they maintain or transmit electronic PHI, they're probably a covered entity. You, the consultant and developer with necessary access to the PHI, are a business associate. Hosting services such as AWS are also business associates. And of course, your subcontractors are now also subject to the same compliance requirements. Now, between 2011 and 2015, healthcare providers were given monetary incentives for being able to demonstrate meaningful use of electronic health records or EHRs. That was the carrot of high tech. After 2015, Penalties were levied for failing to demonstrate such use, and so began the stick. HIPAA also made business associates directly liable for compliance with portions of HIPAA privacy and security rules. Also extended the definition of a business associate and subjected business associates to the possibility of audit, while also increasing enforcement scrutiny for violations of HIPAA and high tech. HITECH also introduced breach requirements and established concrete criteria to determine whether harm occurred as the result of a PHI breach. One could say the HITECH carrot was followed by a substantial stick. Let's talk about developer responsibilities now. Your choices, they need to be made with an understanding and appreciation for the fact that the integrity confidentiality and availability of the data within your control is sacrosanct. You must also be mindful that in the words of Stephen Blackwell, the forces of evil are fully funded. Responsibilities. As a business associate, it will be important for you to define with your client the actual scope of your responsibilities. Now, as the developer, you'll likely be responsible for data protection. You may or may not also be responsible for systems and network protection. And unless your stable of talent happens to include an experienced writer with compliance expertise, you're unlikely to develop the business rules that your client will follow, and you certainly won't be responsible for enforcing them. And that brings me to business associate agreements. A covered entity is required to have a business associate agreement with you prior to disclosing or sharing any electronic PHI with you. And in addition to your agreement to comply with all applicable security requirements, 
this document protects the covered entity by formalizing your agreement to use PHI solely for meeting your obligations to the covered entity and as many as may otherwise be required by law or regulation, and that on termination of the agreement, you will return or destroy all PHI in your possession. You'll implement and you'll implement appropriate and reasonable safeguards to protect electronic PHI. You'll implement appropriate safeguards to prevent the unauthorized use or disclosure of PHI. More specifically, you will implement administrative, physical, and technical safeguards that reasonably and appropriately protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the electronic PHI that you create, receive, maintain, or transmit on behalf of the covered entity. You will notify the covered entity of any known breach of unsecured PHI and cooperate with their breach analysis procedures, including risk assessment, if requested. You will report to the covered entity any security incident and you will, to the extent practicable, mitigate any known harmful effect of a use or disclosure of PHI by yourself, employees or agents uh, in violation of the agreement. You will take reasonable steps to ensure that employee actions or omissions don't cause you to breach the terms and you'll have and apply appropriate sanctions against any employee, subcontractor, or agent who uses or discloses the covered entity's PHI in violation of the agreement or applicable law. You're also acknowledging that to ensure the covered entity's compliance, the Secretary of HHS has the right to audit your records and practices related to the use and disclosure of PHI. And a similar but separate business associate subcontractor agreement is also required if you engage the services of a non-employee. And the same applies to hosting providers. A breach is essentially the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of protected health information in a manner not protected or not permitted by the HIPAA rules. High tech requires prompt notifications of a breach event and the failure to comply with these requirements can result in a significant financial penalty. Notifications must be sent to the impacted individuals, HHS, and to the media if more than 500 individuals were impacted. The timing requirements for these notifications vary somewhat based on how many individuals were impacted by the breach and your own state laws may be more strict in this regard. Now, it's typically the covered entity who will actually issue these notifications, including to the media if warranted, but business associates are required to promptly report the discovery of a breach. You must also cooperate in their breach analysis procedures, which, as I mentioned earlier, may include performing a risk assessment if requested. Now, if you're not 100% convinced about the importance of following the terms of your business associate agreement, consider the potential damage to your reputation that could be wrought by our friend, the media hyena. Now, if you're working with a team, you obviously don't want them causing a breach. So you'll need to think about who's going to be on your internal team. That would include, for example, FileMaker developers, non-FileMaker developers, such as web, MySQL, et cetera, and of course, network admins. Now, when choosing your team, you want trustworthy individuals, preferably with a history of following best practices, not only with security, but in their code. Remember, data integrity and availability are among the security rules' primary objectives, so an intern honing their skills may not be the way to go on a HIPAA project. You also need to set expectations with your team. In addition to communicating clearly their roles and responsibilities, you are required by high tech to have and apply appropriate sanctions. Regardless of who might have actually been responsible, remember that if there is a breach, your own policies may be subject to audit. You should take similar precautions with any non-employee team members. And if a subcontractor or hosting provider doesn't have a business associate agreement directly with the covered entity themselves, you need to make sure that a subcontractor business associate agreement is in place prior to granting any access to systems that contain PHI. Now, you'll need to define your own best practices based on your environments, but here are a few examples of 
what I follow and, and a few questions for you. First, do you save full access passwords to your client systems in your keychain, for example? And what about admin passwords saved in your browser for a client server admin console? As a general rule, I never save these details in my local keychain. I, I figure that if I start doing it or I do it once, I won't remember when I did it or for whom I did it. So I just never, ever do it. Uh, it's a little more difficult, <laughs> but a little more timely to look up some of those passwords sometimes, but it is more secure. Now, you'll also want to consider at times maybe using a proxy or separate file with reduced privileges for reporting and other low-level access tasks. That'll allow you to broaden your user base without increasing your risk. And this is a real important one. Do not ever set a full access account to externally authenticate. Bad juju. You'll want to implement and follow business rules that are appropriate for your environment. If you work in an office with cleaning crews, for example, don't leave paper lying around if it contains PHI. You'll want to lock it up when you leave and shred it when you're done with it. I happen to follow the exact same rules when I work from home. Now, here's another good one. Do you log out when you step away from your desk? And remember, an open app that contains PHI should never be left unattended. When I'm at the office, I'm in the habit of logging out of my desktop when I walk away from my desk, always. And when I'm at home, my rule is that I log out when I clock out, even if I'm just breaking for lunch and don't plan to leave the house. Honestly, I'm a bit of a klutz and you just never know what might happen between my desk and the kitchen or back. HIPAA specifics, fun. Okay, the security rule itself includes two types of rules. Those are standards and implementation specifications. All of the standards are required, but implementation specifications include both required and addressable rules. Makes sense, right? <laughs> sure. All right, the security rule itself includes 54 separate rules consisting of 18 standards and 36 implementation specifications, which are classified further as either administrative, physical, or technical. Now, our primary focus as developers is on the technical. So you're probably wondering, what's the actual difference between required and addressable, and why do we care? Well, required means required, and a, an addressable rule is also required but only if implementation is deemed reasonable and appropriate. So how is that determination made? First, you'll review the rule and determine if it is defined as required. If it is, then it must be implemented if it's applicable. If it's not, then it's addressable and you or your client will need to perform a risk analysis and evaluate a risk mitigation strategy, the existing security measures, and the costs associated with implementation. Based on these findings, the covered entity, usually following your guidance in combination with their budget, must decide if implementation of the measures necessary to comply are both reasonable and appropriate. If they are, then the rule must be implemented, and if they're not, then the justification for not implementing the rule must be documented. Now, this documentation is ultimately the covered entity's responsibility, but you may be asked to provide supporting details for this. For advice on how to translate the HIPAA regulations into actionable development tasks, I would refer you to my 2019 DevCon session, Compliance as a Process, FileMakers Your Toolbox, and to page seven of my white paper, FileMaker and HIPAA, a tool of compliance. The white paper is available from Claris Support and the DevCon session is available in Claris Community, but you don't have to remember that because you can find both at har.fm slash HIPAA, all lowercase, har.fm slash HIPAA. Now, if you intend to develop a compliance system, a thorough review of the applicable regulations is in order, but there's no need or time to actually review all 54 rules today. The following short list summarizes for brevity the technical requirements that will impact your development choices. Not all of these will be applicable to every project, 
but those that appear in green are related to requirements. And those are access control, access reporting, user authentication, password management, auto log off, incident tracking, encryption, and that's encryption at rest, by the way, data integrity, audit log, data authentication, contingency planning, and user documentation, which by the way, is not a technical requirement, but we'll cover that a little bit more later. Developing for compliance. Now HIPAA does not actually specify particular methodologies because the regulations, they're expected to endure while technology is expected to continue evolving. Now there are plenty of security specific resources that have been developed by the community. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of how to secure your app, but I would be remiss if I didn't take a few moments to remind you of some of the most applicable options. And these are important because we're building custom apps, which means you won't find an on off switch to make it HIPAA compliant. Instead, you'll need to layer options that are the most appropriate for your app when deployed in its intended environment starting with the FileMaker native security tool set, your accounts, privileges, extended privileges, file access, field level validations, encryption at rest, et cetera. Your data and design driven options can be invaluable. They'll allow you to enforce roles and privileges, restrict access and functionality via custom menus, script triggers, hide conditions, et cetera. And when it comes to scripting, remember, you want to control the experience and exposure. So you'll use on first window open religiously. <laughs> Excuse me, you will conditionally fork your scripts at times. And you may even employ validated scripts if you have multiple files. That'll prevent scripts from being launched without the required parameters. And for hosting and network requirements, you'll need to encrypt the traffic You'll probably want to employ idle timeout and follow some good backup hygiene. Let's return now for a closer look at the essential dozen and explore some of our development options for compliance. To meet the requirement for access control, you'll need to deny you access to unauthorized users, require user specific logins, incorporate access controls and user authentication, apply encryption at rest, and that's to all files. Use SSL for your network traffic, restrict refer referential access to the files to keep them from being linked to by others. And you'll need to implement appropriate external security measures if your app uses external data sources. And remember that although I'm sure you and your team are absolutely brilliant, in the absence of comprehensive access controls, your apps will be susceptible to the wily and devious nature of the nefarious. They're lurking, they're there everywhere, not where you're looking. Now to meet the requirement for access reporting, you can uh, use the server logs, obviously, which will include both successful and unsuccessful access attempts. You can add session logs to record and maintain a full history of successful system entry and integrate activity logs to record processes like server-side schedules that have the potential to bypass your start scripts. Perhaps a, sub, a server schedule is running a script that runs in an external file that is not the one that launches the start script, right? Now this example shows the running of several server-side scripts and several of these entries include the results and total runtime as well. So they're very useful information here in addition to meeting some access reporting requirements. An activity log like this can also be used to track the performance of specific processes over larger swaths of time than can be accessed from a single server log because of course they fill up and then replace themselves and overwrite themselves. For user authentication, you'll wanna choose the most appropriate authentication method and short of a single user app, role-based options are going to be required. So let's look at assigning roles and privileges. First, we're gonna add a role. And you'll notice when I add this role that the privilege of C password is inherited. Now let's add another role. And you'll see that more privileges are going to be inherited. 
We can also assign a privilege directly. And we can disable roles or privileges at any time. Now, after turning them back on and returning to our summary panel, we'll see that I've been assigned two roles, I've inherited five privileges, and I've been explicitly assigned one privilege. After roles and privileges, after roles and privileges have been assigned, the start script that runs when the app is open creates a session record and collects the user's active privileges, which can then be recorded in a global field or variable for quick reference by hide conditions, scripts, and other objects. Shown here are three variations of simple custom function calc that will return a Boolean true-false result for use with hide conditions, scripts, et cetera. The first one on the left is user has privilege, and this one is looking at a global variable to determine if it's present. The next one, user is role, is looking at a field to do the same test. And the third one, user has department, is actually using the filter values instead of our custom function of value exists to get the same type of result. Password management. The covered entity must have the ability to add and remove authorized users, but it's often or could become true that the individuals tasked with this responsibility won't or shouldn't have full access privileges. Fortunately, for an app that uses only FileMaker accounts, the necessary functionality can be easily scripted. Now, auto log off is a requirement and it's easy to implement. But you need to remember that idle timeout requires both the session timeout setting in the FileMaker server admin and a privilege set that allows the server to disconnect. Now, if you're going to deploy an unhosted standalone file that contains PHI, you'll need to employ an alternate approach or have business rules surrounding its use to ensure compliance. Incident tracking. Now, before we can determine how best to track incidents, we need to understand what qualifies as an incident. A security incident is the attempted or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of information, or interference with system operations in an information system. Now, whether or not you will be responsible to provide incident tracking will depend entirely on your agreed scope of work. And your methods for tracking incidents will likely vary depending on the types of incidents being tracked and the level of incursion. A multi-layer approach might include a combination of access, audit, and activity logs, in addition to using some external system monitoring like Zabbix or, uh, well, others. <laughs> encryption. And here we're talking about encryption at rest. So encryption of PHI protects confidentiality by preventing unauthorized disclosures, including when physical access to a file has been compromised. So it's always been an essential and required component of compliance. And thanks to encryption at rest, those old days of complex data structures are behind us, along with their multiple versions of each protected field that were necessary in order to manage their encryption and decryption processes. Now, there is, in my opinion, simply no excuse for not implementing encryption at rest. And I would further argue that all files should always be encrypted, regardless of whether or not they're expected to contain PHI. Client requirements are ever evolving, and it's simply too easy to introduce functionality and data to a file that wasn't originally expected to require encryption. You must also encrypt your network traffic using SSL and if your ecosystem includes external data sources like MySQL that also contain PHI, these should be encrypted as well. Now to comply with data integrity requirements, you need to create an environment where create, edit, and delete functionality is not only controlled, which you can do easily via accounts and privileges, but where this functionality is limited to authorized users under proper circumstances. The tricky part here is in the definition of proper, excuse me, which is determined not by statute, but by the covered entity who will establish which roles are appropriate for whom and what and when. 
Unfortunately, you can support the sometimes complex and changing definitions of authorized and proper by incorporating data-driven role and function-based access controls like I demonstrated a few moments ago. Consider the plight of O's ophthalmology, where our receptionist, Sally Squirrel, is the only user for God only knows what reason in the office with access to edit the scheduling calendar. But she gets sick and has to leave. So someone else whose primary role doesn't normally include the need uh, to access this functionality, we'll say, I don't know, Dr. Owl, for example, may need to temporarily assume Sally's role. If you're using and relying entirely on FileMaker native accounts and privileges, this is going to be a difficult task without someone having full access uh, or man access to password management controls. But with a role and function-based access system built into your app, this will be an easy thing to deal with. Another component of data integrity may apply if data is transmitted electronically, in which case you may also need to employ data authentication methods to ensure transmission accuracy. Let's take a quick look at custom menus, another tool you can employ to ensure data integrity. And we can see that our standard FileMaker menus include shortcuts for new, duplicate, and delete. Switching to management menus, we no longer have access to the duplicate shortcut. And if we select new or delete from either the menu or via keyboard shortcuts, the process is now controlled by a script. Our basic menus contain none of these options. So if we want to provide this functionality, we'll have to add a button or some other access. And finally, our modal menus include little to nothing as they should or shouldn't. Our next demo will illustrate the use of script triggers to control object access. We'll also show how the same script running with the same parameter can behave differently based entirely on field formatting. Now with my edit trigger status parameter set to null, I can edit the checkbox, but not the edit box. After changing my parameter to zero, I'm unable to edit either. And then after switching my parameter to one, I am able to edit either. Now let's take a look at how this works. To my checkbox formatted field, I've attached an on object modify script trigger. And to my edit field, I've attached both on object modify and on object enter triggers. Now all three of these triggers call the exact same script and use precisely the same parameter. So why do I have an on entry trigger on the edit field, but not on the checkbox field? Well, it turns out that fields formatted as checkbox or radio button actually behave differently. The very act of selecting or deselecting a value is what triggers the field to know that it's been entered. But by that point, the value's already been edited. So attaching an on object enter trigger is redundant and frankly won't always perform as expected. Now let's take a look at the script. The script supports three options, no editing, allow editing, and exit field, using the very simple parameters of zero, one, and null. It can be used and applied to other objects as well, such as preventing an end user from closing a popover or switching panels during a controlled process or workflow. And the reason it works to prevent editing a checkbox or radio button field is because the no editing option includes an undo step. Audit logs, they come in many flavors and can be used to track multiple details. You will need to track data modification where appropriate and relevant and system access to provide your client with mechanisms for review. I should mention also, though it's not on the slide, that there are some tables that are self-auditing, transactional tables that only create records and are not edited. Those are self-auditing by nature, and so you may not need to audit those. Let's take a look at a couple of audit logs. Our first example here, you can see clearly uh, we've used JSON to capture the details. 
and the history of activity in a record. I'm going to add the next panel here so we can see the full history. So we can see that in this record, it was the record was created by Webb. We know where it was created. We even know the name of the window that they were using at the time. Then we now see that M. Meyer came in and populated expense entry from JSON. We can see what the status was, where it occurred. Then we can see that L. Admin came in and selected a batch. That was the parameter for the script payable batch controls. So we know by this information that L. Admin attached this record to a batch. We can then see that it was prepped for validation. And in the very last listing here, we can see that it failed and our status was error. Now, the calculation behind this is in an auto enter field that replaces itself and it boils down to setting the JSON, defining what you want to include, when the different details will be recorded, like, you know, you're not going to record a script parameter if there wasn't one, etc. And we use an evaluate calculation at the end of our let to trigger this to update whenever the fields are edited that we care about. This is a much simpler example in another auto enter self replacing field where we really just need timestamps, account name, and the data from one or two fields when they're edited. And again, you'll see I'm using the evaluate function. One of the values of using evaluate versus a let statement with a trigger field is that those trigger fields won't give you the desired results when recording when data is actually cleared where evaluate will evaluate even if the data is cleared from a field. Now, data authentication. Now, we, the data integrity requirement that we discussed earlier protects against unauthorized alteration or disruption. Or destruction. This is not that. This refers instead to a system being able to substantiate that PHI has not been altered or destroyed in an unauthorized manner. So this is essentially a requirement to prove that the data integrity controls were successful. But how do you prove that something didn't happen? An audit trail can document alterations and deletions, but the mere auditing of activity does not inherently prevent unauthorized activity. A comprehensive set of controls should be employed to ensure that the failure of unauthorized to ensure the failure of any unauthorized attempts. And formal test plans can be written and QA testing performed to prove and document those successful failures. For contingency planning, the covered entity must be able to retrieve their data during or immediately following an emergency, which renders either the data or usual security controls unavailable. This is where the availability part of the objectives of the security rule come into play. To accomplish this, you'll need to establish a reliable backup schedule and coordinate with your client to ensure that an appropriate contingency plan is in place. So if they are not susceptible to volcano eruptions, you don't need a contingency plan for that. If they're in an earthquake prone zone, you need to consider that. Also, your backups need to be frequent, encrypted, tested, and stored off-site, which means, of course, if your client is located in a hurricane-prone region, their off-site backups should not be. Though user documentation is not a technical requirement, do good documentation can serve multiple purposes, and it supports appropriate use. It comes in many forms as well, uh, from tooltips and legends to providing an external interactive QA tool to internal documentation that may in fact turn out to be reusable by the client. And by the way, while I'm on the topic of documentation, don't forget to self-document your own code. Remember, the next person who needs to figure out what a script is doing or how a calc is working might be you. So here are a few documentation examples. The first one, a tooltip text custom function that I use in systems where you need tooltips for training purposes, 
but you have a lot of them, which means users who are more experienced with the system get tired of the tooltips popping up all the time. And so you can disable the tooltips by attaching all tooltips using this custom function, then use a single control to turn your tooltips on and off. Below that, we see a legend that I have on a footer of a table view. It has a lot of codes. This shows the user, reminds them what those different codes mean. And in fact, in this example, you can see that it highlights the code that was used for the record that we're on. Our error code was three, which is no pay lines. It's real easy and quick to identify that. There's actually a second legend off to the right for our posted column, which has a value of two, but I don't actually have to look at the data to see that because manual entry for posted value of two lights up right there in my legend. Very helpful. My next example is of an interactive report where users come into this report and they decide whether or not these things are going to be paid. In that posted column, they're going to set a value. If something's not going to be paid, they're going to have to say why. So they don't always remember which, you know, which codes mean which reason. And so we give them a handy popover with the legend explanation of what the different codes mean and the repercussions of each one. The next example is a more traditional documentation of workflow. I know some are more into the numbered steps outline format, very few images. I'm more visual. I like, you know, click this, you get that, then you click this, you get this next thing. Um, so if you do documentation like that, you may want to share that with your client for them to put in their archives under their compliance and training. And an internal workflow example like this one, which I would use internally as I'm mapping out a particular workflow or process or decision tree, um, I might or might not share that with the client depending on why I'm creating it in the first place. Am I trying to get buy off from them, in which case I'm going to share it with them, or am I just doing it internally to share with my team? Um, an internal workflow example like this, though, could be used by the covered entity in their own compliance documentation. So if you're not sharing these internal workflows, you might reconsider that for a HIPAA project. All right, let's talk deployment. The first and most important consideration when supporting compliance across multiple environments within and beyond the FileMaker platform is an evaluation of risk. Now, your app's level of risk will not only guide the choices you make for addressing requirements, but it also serves to inform you and your client when it comes to defining responsibilities. Now, most of our apps are ever evolving, which means initial risk assessments will need to be revisited over time, though often within the more limited scope of a, of a particular feature or perhaps the introduction of a new access point. So what does your risk profile look like? How many users do you anticipate? On which platforms, Pro, Go, Custom Web Publishing, or perhaps Data API? What's your mix? And remember, more users equals greater risk. Now, you also want to keep in mind that access points exist to support communications in and or out. So naturally, each introduces a potential point of vulnerability, which obviously increases risk. We like to consider requirements from the context of FileMaker first, then overlay those requirements and your approach to addressing them onto each additional access point. Is the requirement even applicable? Will your approach in FileMaker extend elsewhere? And if not, how will you or a trusted source address it? Now, I believe it was Bruce Lee who said, a wise man can learn more from a foolish question than a fool can learn from a wise answer. It's essential that you honestly determine what you can do versus where it may be preferable to retain others. Should you, for example, consider outsourcing document retention? And finally, no one looks forward to giving or receiving potentially bad news, but if you're able to share your concerns, which you have a responsibility to do, while also offering viable solutions to address them, you can be the hero. An honest risk assessment can open the door to expanded opportunities. And as said just a few minutes ago, it will also help you define the limits and establish responsibilities. Now within the FileMaker platform, <laughs> platform, Pro Advanced is just the first of multiple access points. 
We also have Go, Server, Cloud, Web Direct, and Custom Web Publishing. And more recently, the FileMaker Data API. But you also need to consider what else is within the sphere of your ecosystem. Here are just a few examples from the unlimited possibilities beyond the FileMaker platform, from Amazon S3, to QuickBooks, DocuSign, Salesforce, et cetera. Now, there are a number of factors external to FileMaker itself that we also need to consider because they unequivocally affect our ability to deliver. It's also important for you and your client to be on the same page about which of these you will and won't be responsible for. And if not you, then who? It's been our experience that the more regulated the environment, and HIPAA is pretty regulated, the greater the likelihood that you'll find yourself working with the client's internal or outsourced IT departments. And this is perfectly fine, sometimes even preferable. But when you rely and depend on fellow professionals, just remember the mantra, trust but verify. So who's responsible for systems and hardware? What does the network look like? LAN, WAN, remote app, terminal server, VPN, what about web services? Who's responsible for routers and other security devices? And will they follow your recommendations or do you need to follow theirs? Are there any external policies that you need to take into account such as AWS policies? Are identity management and monitoring of systems part of your mix? Now, when assessing your app's level of risk for external threats, begin by identifying the lowest hanging fruit which is data transfer. It's the easiest point to hit a probe, so ensuring security and transit is essential. To do this, you need to first ask yourself, how many hops are there between my desk and the data storage? Are those communication points secure? Are the devices, the hosting environments, are those secure? Is your website secure? And for your clients, an EAR, by the way, is encryption at rest. Is your data encrypted at rest? And for your clients on LAN, is that secure communication? And remote, are they using VPN? And for your web server, you want to ask yourself, what are some of the ancillary services attached to the site? What risk do they introduce and what mitigations are necessary? And think about things like cache data because a web server is easy to turn on without securing. Also, you should be aware, beware of self-updating. And ask yourself, what else is this machine doing? Consider a LAMP machine with Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, Perl, Python, et cetera. What else is the machine doing? And are these functions necessary? And are they secured? And of course, if email is running, stop abort, <laughs> go back to the start, rethink. <laughs> also, you want to ask questions like, is DNS recursion disabled? And think about your talent. Does your guy know what he's doing? I'd like to take a moment to talk about hosting of MySQL data because at Harmonic, we host MySQL data on a completely separate machine. And the MySQL machine is not available to the public at all. It's VPN only access via port 3306 and all data is encrypted at rest. And for this, we use Percona, Percona.com as our MySQL resource. Now, web and cloud. Remember that when deploying via web direct or custom web publishing, SSL must be applied in addition to all other access and authentication requirements. Port 80 is no longer available via web browsers, and consider using a gateway proxy server that reroutes to the real server. Now, I'm often asked about FileMaker Cloud. And the good news is it won't host any unencrypted files, and it requires an SSL certificate. Unfortunately, Claris does not currently offer a path for obtaining the required business associate agreement. So it's not a viable option for apps containing PHI, which brings us to Amazon Web Services. Now you may wonder what is the difference between FileMaker Cloud and FileMaker Cloud for AWS. FileMaker Cloud for AWS was the first generation cloud hosting service offered through the AWS marketplace. 
and deprecation was announced for this in October of 2018. And FileMaker Cloud, of course, is the newest platform as a service offered by Claris. In case you're wondering why the BAA is required, or if you're confused because you thought it wasn't, let me explain. Some cloud providers claim that they were simply conduits, only housing, but never actually accessing PHI on their servers. But with the final ruling, HHS made it clear that conduits are considered business associates subject to HIPAA compliance if they have persistence of custody of PHI. In other words, if PHI data is stored in a data center or on a cloud server, then the hosting provider is considered a business associate. And that means that they must be able to demonstrate that they can meet the HIPAA administrative, physical and technical requirements to assure the confidentiality, integrity and availability of electronic PHI. Now, AWS has adopted a shared responsibility model. And with this delineation of responsibilities, AWS will in fact sign a BAA. And I've provided links for this on our resource page. That concludes the detail of my presentation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure as always. And I have provided a resource page here. Again, uh, this includes a variety of downloads and links which are available for your reference at har.fm slash HIPAA, lowercase har.fm slash HIPAA, including my earlier reference white paper, FileMaker and HIPAA, a tool of compliance, and my 2019 DevCon session, Compliance is a Process, FileMaker is your toolbox. So I am going to close this, turn back on my, my camera. See if we are back where we need to be. There you are. There you are. Open the floor to questions. Also, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Sakura and Matt Monroe to join me. So, because you know, I'm a file maker person. Uh, I we have teams that do uh, web <laughs> networks and stuff like that. So, if you have any more technical questions, I have the resources here in the Harmonic Studio to help answer. Heather, I have a couple questions. Sure. Well, one is pretty simple. You said don't use external authentication for a full access account. Correct. Can you tell me why? So, <laughs> yeah, because someone else has control over the external authentication privileges. That's right? what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because unless you are the person defining that as well, and you may be in an environment where that is the case. If you are, in fact, the administrator of that external authentication source, then sure, it's fine. But that's not usually the case. Right, right. Um, my second question is a little more involved. You, you did a little bit about auditing. Mm -hmm. And have you ever had to do any like really serious auditing where they want to know every change to every any field in the record, you know, mm -hmm. before values, after values, that kind yes. of thing? How mm -hmm. do you handle that? Well, I would say the answer to that depends on how many of those fields are we talking about? How many tables are we talking about? If we're talking about every value that gets changed has to be tracked and audited, but we have a table that has 12 fields, then I think an internal roll your own uh, calculation that updates itself is perfectly sufficient. If, however, you're talking about a large system, lots of tables, lots of fields, and they have that same requirement, which many do, then you're probably going to be better off with a plug-in approach. Do you have any? Yeah, I, I have built audit logs that are as extensive as you've asked about that don't use plugins. The first one I did was actually back in the days of FileMaker 5.5. We didn't even have custom functions. Um, and the cost for 300 users of a plugin was out of the question. So we had to come up with an alternate solution. Um, and it worked very well, but it required a very controlled interface. They uh, like, other programs sure. at the time would have to actually enter edit mode. And what would happen is as they enter edit mode, it would capture all the existing values. When they exited, editing, edit, exited editing mode, it would compare them and identify the changes and record them in a log. 
So it can be done. Uh, it's a matter of which approaches are going to be the most appropriate for the given situation. Yeah, I, I have a situation and it's not HIPAA, but it's just a general business and they have a table of contracts, which is a couple hundred fields, and they want to know anything that's changed in the contract, which includes like 10 related tables, you know, uh, uh, lots of stuff on the contract. And one so, of the, so one of the issues with audit log approaches is that we have the issue of data that updates passively, right? So you have unstored calcs, for example, that might update as a result. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to ask also, are the values in calculations, do those also have to be audited? Because those aren't actually user edits, they're the result of user edits, <laughs> right? So right. you have to really get into some nitty gritty questions in, in really identifying exactly everything you're going to going to audit, but a plug-in approach is going to capture those details that are edited without direct user interaction better than something you might roll yourself. Okay, there are a couple other questions. Can you see the question tab? Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I can read them. Um, Taylor asked, are there HIPAA security plan requirements like the NIST federal database required ones, NIST 8000, 800, et cetera? No. Um, there are not. As I mentioned earlier, they're very ambiguous about the methodology that you need to follow. They reference things like, you know, the most current standards, right? Yeah. <laughs> Appropriate standards. Best but practices. Best practices, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, by the way, this is uh, Matt here and Steve. So... If you have any questions for them, feel free as well to ask. But yes, they, they are very nonspecific in the HIPAA regulations. Yeah, so I think the challenge there is always uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a developer, as a consultant, as a business associate, what's your risk comfort level? Um, because we're essentially being held to a nonspecific set of requirements, right? We're being held to a... a, a kind of an undefined expectation. And so, at least from my perspective, it's a question on a case-by-case -case basis looking at what's the business, what's the system, uh, what's the potential exposure, and then what's the level of um, effort that uh, is justified, what, what's good enough to meet that liability uh, uh, risk, risk exposure level because it's not as specifically defined as if I've got these 18 checkboxes checked, we're good. Um, security is a constantly evolving thing. Um, uh, bad actors come up with new ways to be bad actors every single day. And just new operating systems come up with ways to break things that were perfectly fine every single day, right? So new versions, new operating systems. So um, it's it's a judgment call, it really is. and 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 it's that kind of risk level evaluation uh, that you have to make um, uh, that's a, it's, it's somewhat subjective. Creating audit log records in a separate table or in each record? So it depends. Um, in the examples that I shared today, those are actually in the records themselves. Um, but in those cases, the reason for the auditing was not necessarily for something like HIPAA compliance. They're just really good examples of those approaches. Um, so it depends on, so you would not, for example, keep an audit log that records deletion, record deletion in a, you know, in the record that got deleted, right? You would use a separate activity log. So the activity log that I showed that had examples of server-side schedules, that exact same activity log is used to record record deletions as well. And those are automated. So when someone deletes a record, it actually creates a record in the activity log. It documents what was in the record, who did it, and the reason for doing it as well. So that type of an audit absolutely has to be external to the record. But if the purpose for your audit is so that the information about the history can be available 
then it's perfectly fine for that audit to exist within the record itself so long as it's not going to overwrite and clear its own history. So you do have to be careful about how you write the calc for that. Also, you need to provide your client, and that doesn't mean every end user, but your client, they need to have access to view those audit logs. And if you're talking about audit histories in multiple tables, that's going to be a more complicated thing for you to provide to them if you're storing that data directly in the records. For that, you probably want a centralized audit log table where they can go and find what they need. They also sometimes need not only the need to see the audit log in history, but they might need the option to do a rollback. Um, I haven't encountered many cases where that actually was necessary, but a few years back we had a client who actually had to do a full rollback and the plug-in approach for the um, audit log, though painful at times in the past <laughs> to implement, it's gotten easier, but it, it was a lifesaver to be able to do the rollback from the audit log. I want to I want to throw in something on audit logs. Um, <laughs> that's such a bad word. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, audit logs are kind of a swear word around here um, at Harmonic, and I, I think that just comes from anyone who's built and maintained systems that uh, that have a decent amount of usage and scale over time. Audit logs evolve. are the schema evolves. The, the schema evolves. The there, there's a lot of gotchas and, and audit logs are expensive. They're just flat out expensive, right? So they're expensive to build. They're expensive in compute time. They're expensive in storage space. Uh, they're expensive in backup effort because we're, you know, we've got our data times X uh, anytime we have an audit log. So I think the the push and shove conversation that we end up having uh, here at Harmonic with any of our systems, and I, I think needs to happen with any customer, is what's the right level of auditing? And let's audit what we need to, but let's not audit what we don't have to. Uh, a simple answer that says, I want to know everything that ever happened just cause, that's, that's a fine answer, but if there's no good reason for that, that's a very, very expensive answer. Um, especially if we're talking about something with a lot of records or a lot of change uh, over time. Um, often, we find that uh, if we really look at procedurally a, a given set of operations or a given set of processes, auditing doesn't have to mean an audit log. That 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 state capture may be inherent in how you build the process, right? Uh, of course, that's dependent on a lot of other conditions, but um, audit is one of those things where um, step into it carefully and intentionally because it's not just a magic panacea. There's, there's a lot of gotchas and, and there's a lot of cost involved as well. And, and really dive into what needs to be captured and, and what the usage of that is going to be, you know, what the prevailing need for it is going to be. Uh, and make sure that you're able to answer those questions. You know, if you, can, if you can project yourself into that future auditor's position and say, what does that auditor want to know and can I answer their question? That's really where I like to start uh, with a question from, from an auditing perspective and then work backwards to what's our most efficient and scalable way to do that. And sometimes this is where using a different data model and structure, such as a more transactional table for data where you have to record every change, uh, maybe you want to do that with a transaction model where there really is no editing of existing data. There's just yeah. replacement by a new yeah, it's transaction. A, it's a one time, one time commit. Right, exactly. Yep. And because those are self-documenting. Yep. Self-auditing, I should say, yeah. That I couldn't verbalize myself, that I had the same feelings as you about, about it, but I just didn't express it that well. So we have any other questions today? We, or every, everybody just got it, it was so clear. We just got another question. <laughs> um, thinking, thinking about, about you know, go ahead. Yeah, thinking about core ML integration with any of HIPAA requirements. Yeah. Interesting question, yeah. yes. 
So I think so. So first of all, it, something you know, it's it's brand new, right? FileMaker 19 now supports the ability to uh, uh, spool up and, and execute against a core ML model. Um, I think the devil's in the details here, right? So FileMaker gives us an interesting opportunity with its integration of core ML in that it lets us do the whole thing local. So at one level, we can store the model local, we can execute against the model local, um, and do whatever the result is local. So that's a, a big positive because it can be entirely within an object that's encrypted at rest uh, and so forth. Um, that implies uh, some good things around not running afoul of, whoops, I'm pushing PHI out into something I have no control over and so forth. That's with the model already built. Um, on the other hand, if we need a custom model, that's an entirely different question, right? How do we build and train that model? Well, that means that the environment and the, the, the processes that we're going to have to set up, if PHI is part of that process, uh, that's something almost entirely outside of FileMaker because we're going to be using some other service or some other application, and we're going to have to do specific research there on those kinds of things. And, and I see a, you know, a follow-up comment on, on facial rec recognition, et cetera. So, so I, think, uh, I think just from a standpoint of execution and, and processing, we have some good tools with FileMaker, given that it is, it's basically a sandboxed uh, ML model. It's a sandboxed environment as far as the actual execution part goes. Now, what I won't speak to, and this is where um, I'm not the guy, I gotta hand, hand it back to Heather, is from a practical standpoint, Heather, what's your thought on, you know, we have kind of established practices around when do we show someone PHI? Mm -hmm. When do we let them enter or edit PHI? How does that apply to something like facial recognition, right? If, mm -hmm. if we pass in a picture and what we're actually asking it to do is to look up that person in our database, mm -hmm. that maybe does have some, some HIPAA implications to it, right? Certainly, because role and function-based access is one of the core elements of the HIPAA requirements because the only way that you can ensure that there is no unauthorized access is to explicitly define what does authorized mean. And as in the example of our receptionist squirrel, uh, sometimes that is easily defined by someone's role. Sometimes it's not. And HIPAA requires flexibility in addition to the extreme type controls. So your client, the covered entity, they need to be able to swiftly make changes to who is authorized and what are they authorized to do. Someone, you know, might get hit by the proverbial bus, someone else has to take over, someone's going on maternity leave, etc. These things happen. And the accessibility of that data to the covered entity itself is critical. So they have to be able to make those changes. That means that you have to design access to different functionalities in ways that you're able to control whether or not the person who's gonna click that button even has access to see that button in the first place. And that's really where, you know, that really simple script that I showed, I use that like everywhere <laughs> because I can control visibility of data. I can control, uh, entry to a field, editing of a field, et cetera, all with just that simple control. And at the time that I'm calling it, I can feed it the information that needs to be used to decide whether or not that's applicable. I mean, you could have a crazy rule where this person's only allowed to do this thing on Tuesdays. You know, you can write that right there uh, on the button, on the hide condition, is this available to this person today and now? And you have that flexibility with FileMaker. And, uh, but it can get pretty complicated depending on the size of your system and uh, how many objects you have to control. But I would, I, I, would, I would think- I would advise against day-specific business well, rules. That's, that's yeah, probably yeah, yeah. not- <laughs> <laughs> I don't know 
probably not. Not a best practice. Probably not. But you know, we have we have one system where, uh, and this is not exactly a user can't do this, but it's not a bad example of it where uh, we process expense reports and these expense reports are submitted by employees and if they're submitting a mileage expense report and they've reported mileage for Tuesday, well, they better have also submitted a timesheet for hours worked on Tuesday. And so we have to validate for that in the system. So that's another thing too. Sometimes you want to consider not just what data is entered, but authenticating that data may also be important in some situations as well. So in the facial recognition example, that, you know, as you described, Steve, that, that boxed in controlled model uh, is great with the core ML, but what are we gonna do in response to that? If we find a match, what are we gonna do? And does the person who requested it have the authority to actually do that? And maybe we're using it for more than one thing. Maybe we're doing it so the receptionist can quickly identify someone when they walk in the door. That's one thing that's very temporary, but that doesn't mean she has the ability to modify that patient's record and change who they are because of what the facial recognition thought. Yeah, maybe we can build a core ML that automatically figures out whether something's PHI and just just there you go it. there you go <laughs> uh, what I didn't share was the really really long list of specific indicators and identifiers that do qualify as PHI because some of them seem really redundant but you know basically the rule is if someone can be identified with that information a specific individual can be identified with that, then it's PHI. And sometimes actually, and this is important to mention, sometimes that isn't actually information that's about the person that you can identify. So for example, the name of a parent. Well, that is not, that doesn't identify the child, but it certainly could be used to identify the child. Right, so I think as you've explained to us in the past, it may be it may well be the combination of things gender Correct. is is pretty non-specific you got about a 50 percent uh chance of, of of being right or wrong on that but gender combined with this combined with that combined with the other thing you know four or five data points and you may have narrowed your pool to a person right an individual one example i've used from was actually goes way back to the very first HIPAA project i was involved with you know, 19 or so years ago and um, this was for the south carolina department of mental health and they were in need of a system for their clinicians who worked in the public schools in elementary schools junior highs and high schools uh, with children, they needed to track their clinical notes, their test results, evaluations, et cetera. And HIPAA at that time was actually just a proposed rule. So we were preparing for the compliance at the time, again, back in the FileMaker 5.5 and six days. But the example I used there was, does the name of the teacher, does that identify the student? Well, you know, in most cases, the name of a teacher is not going to be enough information, even combined with gender. It's probably not with our class sizes anymore enough to actually identify a person. But if the teacher happens to be a private tutor, then the name of the teacher could very easily be used to identify the name of the child that they're tutoring. So you really have to go on a case by case basis. And I don't mean on a record by record basis. I mean on the basis of what is the intended use of this system. And if the expectation is that teachers that we're talking about have class sizes of 15 to 30 kids, then that's really not something we need to protect. Now, the really great news though, is that with encryption at rest, we can encrypt everything and we no longer have to make those decisions on a field by field basis like we used to have to do um, because sometimes we had two or three fields for every encrypted field in order to manage the the process of encrypting and decrypting without blowing up our data. So now you're just you're just waxing us down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those days are gone. I'm, I'll, I'll stop talking about them. <laughs> so there's a there's a question here about uh, working on a HIPAA compliant project. Uh, go, Stephen. 
Um, uh, that was the name of the person asking the question. Uh, are there any sources where I can go to ask questions as they arise? Um, I, I, I think there's, there's a variety of answers to that, but I'll let you take a, a starting crack at it, Heather. So I would say no, there is not that I'm aware of right now, and certainly not for FileMaker developers, there's not you know, like a chat room or a Facebook group or something like that. Um, there's no reason why there couldn't be. Um, I certainly wouldn't mind being involved with a, a project like that. But really right now there are a lot of resources for getting information about HIPAA, but very few of them are going to be FileMaker specific. They are going to be more generic. And a lot of them are going to be marketing efforts to try to get you to uh, take on a service to help you make the decision about what is and isn't wrong with your system. And a lot of times you haven't even built it yet. So <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's not appropriate. It can be very expensive and onerous. And really, in my experience, if you focus on those core principles of the security rule and use common sense and good FileMaker skills, um, I don't really think we need an outside consultant, but I get a lot of questions that I never thought I'd get, you know, that things that haven't come up for me, but think about it. Yeah. Okay. I see that as a good question. So, so yeah, having a, having a chat group somewhere that's FileMaker specific would be a great idea, but right now I'm not aware of any place like that. I think the thing I'd add back to marketing uh -huh. <laughs> is that we, we have occasionally uh, operated strictly in a consultative role. True. Um, and, and in general, those are pretty short engagements. Um, it's just a handful of hours where um, often uh, what's really effective is getting the key stakeholders with the client, uh, whether it's on a call or involved in a process with someone that you can represent as an authority on whatever the problem point is, right? And that may that may differ. Uh, it, an attorney might be the right uh, counterpart there. Um, someone like Harmonic, where you can point at, look, there's this article and and this other thing that says they know what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. whatever it is, find that right counterpart, um, get the stakeholders involved. And then document those business decisions. That's a that's you know a key part of this whole thing, is to say here's what we chose to do and here's why we chose to do it. Because when something does go wrong, um, uh, the, the process immediately goes back to well why wasn't that thought of or or why why did we do it that way? Um, if we have good reasoning and it was something that's unexpected, then the process to redress that is, okay, well, here's how the world changed in the meantime. We now realize that, so here's how we're gonna address it, and we're gonna further document that, that outcome. If the answer is, yeah, we just didn't try, well, then we're in a different situation, right? So I think um, there, there are sometimes the, the justification is there for engaging outside resources, and sometimes it's it's really just a matter of finding you know finding the the article or the uh, the topic and making sure you're comfortable that you understand it at a technical level and and, and have positively addressed it and that's perfectly adequate. Taylor asks if any of our HIPAA clients have asked us to log the fact that someone just reads a record. In other words, no edits. Um, not for a long time, but yes, and I have done that. Uh, this is where your record level access in your FileMaker security comes in and combine that with a plugin that will, as a result of a calculation, actually create an audit log record somewhere. You can do that by controlling, putting a control on visibility, on the read part of the privilege set. So that is possible. I have done it. But... I'm going to disagree with you, though. Really? I am. Well, it's been a long time since I've done so, it. So, so, uh, and it's and it's not something you directly were involved with, right? Okay. So, okay. so you wouldn't necessarily know. But uh, one of our largest clients is a uh, Medicaid biller. They directly bill Medicaid, and they're a fiscal intermediary, is the term of art. Um, 
they have like uh, like a lot of clients in the medical world. They have, of course, an internal system that has a lot of internal users that has its own sets of rules and requirements around HIPAA and so forth. They also have a very much larger user base that accesses the system through a portal, right? Through a through a web interface, mm -hmm. and while we don't log specific read instances on the internal side, we do log them in the portal. We, we note when someone logs in at all, who they're logging in as, you know, username, user agent, those kinds of things. And we also log when do they access the participants information, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually have a log of this, this set of credentials logged in at this time and accessed these three sets of users uh, information. And that way, uh, we're, we're of course assuming that our programming was good and that they should have been able to access those. But even if there was a hole and you know maybe they were exposed to somebody they shouldn't have been, we would have a log of that. And I think that's the argument for it is that as the, as the accessibility to information increases, potentially the need for logging increases. But again, that gets mm -hmm. back to that whole auditing conversation about how do you do that in a sustainable way, right? So we're in that case, we're logging very simple, very fast transactions into a separate MySQL table that's hosted in the cloud. And, you know, it's just a, just a quick stamp of this username, uh, this timestamp, uh, this ID of information was accessed. Mm -hmm. I would also mention that, well, obviously, in that, and that makes perfect sense in that, that scenario, and it's not running, it's not dependent on FileMaker to do that logging, which I think is also very important. Yeah, and, and we're big fans of marrying up FileMaker plus other technologies. Yeah. So, so one of the things that anyone who's built at scale systems in FileMaker, one of the things that you learn is that one of FileMaker's strengths is not rapidly inserting and deleting records, right? It's it's that is not why you pick up FileMaker as a tool. Um, MySQL, in contrast, is incredibly fast at rapidly creating and deleting records. So um, sometimes pairing up technologies is the right approach for different things like that, mm -hmm. um, and that would be a, a classic example of that. The, the last comment I'd make about that is if you are going to do something, uh, you need to log access to read access to specific records. You need to take some caution in doing that and how you're applying those controls in a FileMaker client situation because do you in fact want to log every single record that was included on a report that might have been run? So this is where the reasonable and appropriate <laughs> test applies. It may be reasonable enough to control who it is that has access to view that report or to export that data without necessarily having to log each readable point that occurred. We have a question here from John. How would you need to set up a network server for client such that some info was inaccessible to everyone and therefore the network ser server was HIPAA compliant? Hey, Matt. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> so, um, network server. So is this just a, I guess this is like a FileMaker server on a network and you want to basically make it uh, inaccessible for everyone except for specific people. Is that? That's, that's how I'm answer? reading the okay. question. So, um, you know, we throw a lot of our servers into the cloud. Um, some of these network issues are a lot more controllable in the cloud. So uh, I, that's kind of where the origin of my answer would be. Um, there are ways in the cloud uh, to basically shut off all inbound packets, shut off all outbound packets, and then you would basically poke the holes that you needed to. Uh, a very simple way to do it would be whitelisting certain IP addresses, but that's not terribly secure because you know IP addresses can be spoofed. Uh, a, a better method would be that you would actually go into, in our case, AWS, 
uh, and create a specific VPN client for that person that when they logged in, they would have access to that server and you'd have to use that vehicle to get access to that server and, the, and that data. Whereas anyone else coming in with any inbound request to that server would be denied. That's a little complicated to set up, but it's kind of a lot more bulletproof than, than uh, whitelisting an, an IP address. Um, you can certainly, with authentication, obviously make it really difficult to get into a server unless you're supposed to be there. But uh, it seemed like the question was, you know, uh, basically making it inaccessible. And so, uh, you know, to have it, uh, to have a VPN client set up where that client is allowed access to a server combines both the authentication aspect of it as well as the network accessibility aspect of it. That's probably the 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 first thing that pops to my mind. I don't know if you can think of anything else, Steve, but that's yeah. That's no, I, I think that's definitely right from a from a network uh, strategy standpoint, and that's kind of uh, speaking to uh, the transport uh, of the data, right? The transport from the server to the client. Whether I'm trying to get at that data over a file share or over a FileMaker connection or over an HTTP connection with a browser. Um, all of those are, are in transit, right? Where the question is, can the packets get through at all? And, and that would be things like having uh, specific uh, either whitelisted IPs or specific ports open. Can they get through at all? And if they can get through, who can see them? So if I require someone to be on a VPN, that's a method of control. Um, and there are other methods of control. So if we're talking about a FileMaker system, and we're controlling login through FileMaker. FileMaker with its accounts and privileges uh, lets us say you can get in or you cannot get in. If, if I can't properly credential into my FileMaker file uh, after I'm either on the right IP address or I'm in the right VPN, I still have that additional level of control, right? So I can make it accessible or inaccessible based on the conditions of of those credentials at that point. And, and so it's it's kind of a stack of, it's a stack of things that at the very, very bottom is, what is that database object or that stack of information? How is it maintained on the server itself, right? Because at the end of the day, that's why encryption at rest is, is a, a beautiful thing. Because at the end of the day, if that stack of data, that stack of ones and zeros is encrypted, and I've properly uh, safeguarded that encryption key, even if someone gets access to that machine and is able to take that file, um, they're, they're out of luck. They, they are not gonna be able to get at my data. And then it builds up from there. So who can get access to the machine, either physically or electronically? Um, who can get access through the network? Who can authenticate into the file? When they authenticate into the file, what can they see and so forth, right? So, Kind of think of it as a stack of issues starting at the bottom all the way to the top where we're getting into some of the other things we were talking about who can see it do we audit that they saw it uh, do we audit that they logged into the system and so on and so forth i'm wondering also at, at, a, at a much simpler level might this also be a, a case for a proxy server well, certainly a proxy server obscures the end goal right. and so, so if if, if Proxy servers are really good at, at uh, protecting a server from a denial of service attack or mm -hmm. from an incursion. If what you're just simply trying to do is say, we've got a server uh, that's accessible, but only to certain people, uh, proxy server de definitely keeps that from an attack. But you, what you're also asking is then, but, but how do we actually really let somebody right. get in there? I, I'm thinking back to way back when, when we were working with the doc server, right? And trying to control web access to documents right. with a limited time frame of accessibility. So we had the one server would make the decision about whether or not to call the other server yeah. and release that in that way. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, we're running out of time here, but Taylor has uh, one last question here we'll take. Uh, does Claris become a business associate if you host your HIPAA database in the FileMaker Cloud and will Claris cooperate with the, such agreements? 
Um, the answer to that was not easy to find, but I did <laughs> have verbal confirmation. Um, they currently will not sign a business associate agreement. So it's not a viable option for files that include PHI. So the FileMaker Cloud is currently offered, the newest FileMaker Cloud, not, you know, FileMaker Cloud for AWS is different. Uh, again, AWS will do this. And I realized that even with FileMaker Cloud, ultimately AWS is actually <laughs> on the back end, the host, but Claris does not currently uh, offer a conduit or a path for us to get that business associate agreement with AWS and Claris is not currently offering it. I don't know if they will or won't. I know that it's been discussed, but that I have no knowledge or insight on the trajectory of that occurring. Yeah. Uh, but it is not currently an option. Yep. So if you if you want to be in the cloud right now, your your best option is um, at the on-premise version of FileMaker installed into a uh, into a, an environment on AWS. Uh, or some other cloud provider where you're able to essentially check all the other check marks that that cloud provider requires for a BAA. Amazon has a list and it's uh, those those details are in Heather's uh, 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 resources on, on the HIPAA page that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, I think we have uh, gone just a couple minutes over our time for today. So Phil. Yes. <laughs> So thank you very much. You did a wonderful job. This was a great presentation and I want to thank, thank you. you and Steve and Matt. That's right, Matt. And everybody at, <laughs> at Harmonic Software Production Studios for allowing us to have some of your time and share all this with us. And thank right. you very much. Thank you for having us. Very and we'll see everybody in, or hear everybody or chat with everybody in three weeks. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.